Mosaic, a daily news program from Link TV, presents a selection of news reports from independent and state-controlled broadcasters from throughout the Middle East. Election officials in Egypt are preparing for one of the most competitive parliamentary elections in the history of the country, which will be executed in three stages. The first one will take place on Wednesday amidst a heated competition among different political parties, especially between the ruling National Party and an independent splinter group. Two days before the first round of elections, observers expect a low turnout, as was the case in the previous presidential elections. They also expect the ruling party to remain in power. The countdown for one of the most competitive parliamentary elections in the history of Egypt has begun. Many groups and parties are competing against each other. The ruling National Democratic Party nominated 444 candidates to run in the upcoming parliamentary elections. A splinter group, which had split from the ruling party, will run under an independent list. In addition, opposition groups joined forces and formed a united coalition to gain as many parliamentary seats as possible. The Muslim Brotherhood nominated 150 candidates to represent their party in the upcoming elections under the controversial slogan, Islam is the solution. With this slogan, they are trying to win more than the 17 seats they won in the last elections. They are hoping to gain more compromises from the government as well. Although voting turnout may fluctuate, elections results are expected to be close to that of 2000. Opposition groups are expected to win more seats than they had in previous elections. Even in the best case scenario, the National Party will not gain more seats than it did in the 2000 parliamentary elections. The party will win approximately 37 to 38 percent of the seats. The rest of the seats will be divided between independent coalitions and opposition groups. These results will not be final. It is likely that some members of the independent party, which had split from the ruling National Democratic Party, will go back and join forces with the ruling party, especially if the ruling party gains more momentum in comparison to the other groups. Parties casted doubts about the transparency of the upcoming elections, accusing the Egyptian government of trying to manipulate the results. They base their fears and suspicions on past elections experiences and in rumors that some candidates of the ruling party had offered bribes to voters. However, the government contends that the elections will be fair and transparent. We formed a national front to compete in the upcoming elections, but I do not believe that the elections will be democratic and free. Ordinary Egyptians have their own guidelines which they base their voting decisions on. One of the most important criteria considered is the candidate's qualifications and capabilities of providing social and primary services to the people. On the other hand, some people call for the election of liberal officials who will make political reforms possible. A number of outcomes may transpire as a result of the upcoming elections. For a Madar program, Abu Dhabi Television, Hani Amara, Cairo. French President Jacques Chirac broke his silence regarding the recent unrest that spiraled out of control in the suburbs of Paris. During an emergency meeting for the French National Security Council, Chirac vowed to restore security and public order to the streets of Paris. He stressed that the law and the legal system should have the last word. Ultra-right-wing leaders, including the former presidential candidate Jean-Marie Lupi, called on the government to take stricter measures against the immigrants, especially those of Arabic or African descent. 
According to the French Justice Ministry, the violence and disturbances that erupted in the suburbs of many French cities took a new turn over the weekend. The region suburbs and a number of French cities witnessed an escalation in the level of violence and disturbances where rioters burned more than 2,500 cars and vandalized a number of schools, public buildings and shopping centers. The French president broke his silence for the first time since the unrest started, vowing to restore public order and security. The government of Dominique de Villepin intensified its efforts to contain the situation. Meanwhile, the French interior minister, Nicolas Sarkozy, whom the opposition accuses of causing the disturbances and demands his resignation, alleges that some extreme organizations are behind the incidents. This was refuted by the Minister of Justice. It is clear that the Interior Minister is trying to hold the immigrants responsible for what is happening. After meeting with some parliament members from immigrants' descent, he issued the following statement. We must address the real issue, the immigrants and their assimilation in the French culture. Today we can see that the French melting pot is facing a failure. We need to re-examine the whole problem of assimilation. Some U.S. and British critics speculate that the French interior minister is trying to escape responsibility and accountability. Many French ministers confirmed it is not the time for any analysis or comments, but that it is the time to stop the violence and unrest. The French president confirmed that stopping the riots is a top priority for the government, which must also preserve the integrity of people and give justice to all. Aujourd'hui, la priorité absolue, c'est le rétablissement. Our priority is to restore public order and security. The last word should be left to the legal system. We realize that the way out of this mess is to respect the integrity of all people by giving them justice and equal opportunity. L'évolution des choses. The government of De Villepin is focusing on ways to counter the violence through legal means. French courts issued over 40 sentences and 40 people are awaiting court hearings. The government is looking for any organization or association representing the immigrants or the Muslim community to negotiate with regarding this current crisis. However, these organizations do not seem to have much support among the rioters. Most people agree that these disturbances are an outcome of 30 years of chronic problems plaguing French suburbs where the second generation of immigrants lives. The solution for this crisis calls for long-term economic and social reforms. However, some French ministers are looking for someone else to blame, such as extremists. Their wishful thinking is to escape political responsibility, holding the immigrants accountable for what is happening. The unprecedented level of violence in France, which was triggered on the 27th of October, has not yet ended. Kimo Morge provides us with these details. On the 27th of October 2005, two French citizens of two immigrant families were electrocuted to death, triggering these riots. On the 28th of October, dozens of young men rebelled against the French police because they believed that the two victims were chased by the police to their tragic death. On the following day, the French interior minister, Nicolas Sarkozy, confirmed that the police did not chase the two young men and said that the rioters are scum. This intensified the disturbances, compelling 400 young men to confront the police in Cliché-sous-Bois, where violence continued for two nights. 
In the end, 30 cars were burned and violence spread to other neighborhoods where immigrant families are living. By the 31st of October, the violence spread to seven more cities. On November 1st, the French Prime Minister de Volpin met with the families of the two victims, but the violence continued for the fifth consecutive day and spread to four French districts. This compelled both de Volpin and Sarkozy to cancel their scheduled visits to Canada, Pakistan and Afghanistan. Meanwhile, President Jacques Chirac called on people to remain calm and maintain self-control. However, these calls did not stop the outbursts of anger for yet another night. On the 3rd of November, the families of the victims filed a lawsuit against an unknown person for failing to help their sons whose lives were in danger. The government intensified its efforts to contain the situation by launching mass arrest campaigns on the 5th of November, the same day the riots spread to Paris. Clashes between police forces and rioters took a dangerous turn in the past two days, as the rioters attacked dozens of commercial stores and buildings and burned 2,700 cars throughout France. In the process, 29 police officers were injured and hundreds of people were arrested. The North African nations reacted strongly to the news of the current unrest in French suburbs and cities. People in the Moroccan capital of Ribat very closely follow the political crisis in France. Moroccans, as other citizens from North African countries, are monitoring the recent uprisings in the French suburbs. They are paying close attention to these events because most rioters are immigrants of African descent. In Rabat, most people are preoccupied with watching and talking about this crisis, which is taking place in the French capital of Paris, also known as the capital city of lights. Most Moroccans believe that poverty and the immigrants' poor living conditions ignited these waves of unrest and disturbances. It is a normal reaction by the immigrants who are impoverished and living in old, run-down neighborhoods. The French government should take into consideration the reasons behind these riots and work out a solution to these chronic problems. Some Moroccans believe that racism and discrimination against the immigrants by French citizens were the last straws. Immigrants who are French citizens are still treated as minorities and second class and are not considered French. Some Moroccans believe that a conspiracy is being fabricated against immigrants of the French suburbs. It is possible that the extremist right party is behind these disturbances, creating a diversion prior to the upcoming elections. No one really knows if anyone will benefit from the escalation of violence in France. Nevertheless, in Morocco, media outlets benefited financially from this political turmoil as their viewers doubled in the wake of this crisis. Deputy Assistant Secretary of State for Near Eastern Affairs, Elizabeth Dibble, met with Prime Minister Fouad Senora this morning at the Grand Sarai. High on the agenda was an interna international aid conference expected to take place in Beirut next month. Present at the meeting were Finance Minister Jihad Azour, Economy Minister Sami Haddad, and the Premier's advisor Mohammad Shatih and Deputy Ghazi Youssef. Upon his arrival to Beirut yesterday, Dibble met with Foreign Minister Fawzi Salouh. Developments in Lebanon and Syria top discussions. Dibble stressed that no comparison could be made between the help and support that the United States was offering to Lebanon and Syria's former interference in its domestic affairs. She welcomed Syrian decision to launch its own probe into former Premier Rafi Hariri's assassination, but urged Damascus to fully cooperate with the international probe. <laughs> The ball is now in the Syrian court to, to cooperate, and we very much hope 
that the government of Syria will cooperate with uh, Judge Mellis in his investigation, and that at the end of the day, uh, there will be answers, and that the perpetrators of the crime will be brought to justice. The American ambassador to Lebanon, Jeffrey Feltman, inaugurated yesterday the third annual trade fair promoting U.S. products and services, dubbed Made in America 2005, in the presence of U.S. Department of State Deputy Assistant Secretary for Near Eastern Affairs, Elizabeth Debon. Feltman affirmed the commitment of the U.S. to work with the Lebanese government and people in order to help them realize their dreams of a stable, prosperous, and democratic country. May Fawaz has the story. Made in America is the third annual trade fair promoting U.S. products and services in Lebanon. Co-sponsored by the American Lebanese Chamber of Commerce and ID Printing Press, Made in America exhibits 314 companies of various business sectors, including information, communication and environmental technology, healthcare, agriculture, and the energy sector that show the latest advancement in American technology. The fair was inaugurated by U.S. Ambassador Jeffrey Feltman in the attendance of various top officials, including Foreign Minister Fauzi Salou. Feltman insisted on the importance of the relationship between the U.S. and Lebanon and the commitment of the U.S. to assist the Lebanese towards achieving a more prosperous future. The United States accords great importance to its relationship with Lebanon, and we remain firmly committed to working with the government and the people of Lebanon to realize their dream of a stable, prosperous, and democratic country. We recognize the great potential of the private sector to promote economic growth in Lebanon, and thus we see an opportunity for U.S. business to participate. U.S. Department of State Deputy Assistant Secretary Elizabeth Dibble was confident changes Lebanon was undergoing would attract more interest on behalf of American companies to invest in Lebanon. Lebanon is, I think, at a, at a crossroads. Um, there, are, there were some very unfortunate things, obviously, the, the tragic assassination of former Prime Minister Hariri, but the fact that this year Lebanon will be celebrating its Independence Day for the first time in a long time without uh, the Syrian uh, presence here uh, is indicative of the, the change. And I think on the economic side, we have 315 companies represented here, uh, which is an increase of about 200 companies over last year's event. I think it gives, um, it demonstrates, it underscores the deep economic and commercial ties between the U.S. and Lebanon as Lebanon makes those changes, makes those reforms to improve the economic climate here. Made in America 2005 is open to the public on November 8 and 9 from 5 to 10 p.m. Entry to the fair is free. The Free Patriotic Movement, headed by MP Michel Aoun, held its weekly meeting in Arabia yesterday. MP Aoun stressed on the importance of respecting the people's will in the presidential debate. Aoun, who is running for the presidential seat, called upon the government to tackle some pending issues, such as the disappearance of Imam Musa Sadr and his companions, as well as taking its investigation into Hariri's murder seriously until the truth is reached. The Patriotic Party also discussed the disappearance of some Lebanese citizens in Syrian and Israeli prisons. According to a Lebanese military source, the Lebanese army fired in the direction of Israeli helicopters yesterday that were flying over the southern Lebanese coast. The anti-aerial machinery of the Lebanese army took action between the port of Sidon and Tyre, about 60 kilometers south of Beirut. The Israeli aviation regularly breaks Lebanon's sound barrier despite UN demands calling Israel to respect Lebanon's sovereignty. The Lebanese army generally intervenes when Israeli helicopters and planes fly at low altitudes. With assets far exceeding the country's entire GDP, analysts said Lebanese banks have tremendous capacity for regional expansion. Most have made use of change to central bank rules, allowing banks to devote 25% of their equity to business abroad. Most of Lebanon's top banks are already up and running in Syria, while others are awaiting licenses to open in Virgin Arab markets. Blom and Audi Bank began operating in Jordan last year, and sources say that Blom would bid for 
for Egypt's Mesut Romanian Bank in a deal that would be worth about $103 million. On Monday, Cairo Far East Bank said Egypt had authorized Saudi to conduct a due diligence study and step that, that usually leads to an acquisition. Several other Lebanese banks are opening in Algeria and Sudan and in the Gulf. Bankers and analysts say all this was just the beginning. Lebanese banks are expected to enhance their regional stature while diluting their exposure to $36 billion of government debt that overshadows local commercial lending. A 39-year-old Lebanese Venezuelan professor, Jamal Khaled Rishani, was killed while having lunch with his Lebanese wife in a restaurant in Valencia. The assassination was believed to have been planned by South American drug barons. The attackers shot 10 bullets into Rishani's head as soon as his wife walked towards the bathroom. He died immediately. Venezuelan police believe the motive behind the murder was his shattering of a big drug pushing Venezuelan racket when he was a trial judge with the Venezuelan judicial system. Rishani was in Beirut last September where he concluded an academic cooperation pact between the Venezuelan Latin American University where he taught and the Lebanese University. It was not yet known whether Rishani was buried in Valencia or whether his body would be brought to Lebanon. In Iraq, a car exploded this morning near a university in eastern Baghdad, killing at least one person and injuring another. Last night, a roadside bomb killed six policemen and three civilians in a neighborhood in Baghdad. In other developments, military sources announced that at least 36 insurgents and one U.S. Marine were killed in the major U.S.-led offensive, dubbed Operation Steel Curtain, in the western town of Kiem, near the Syrian border. Some 3,500 soldiers and Marines, including 1,000 Iraqi troops, were involved in the operation. Meanwhile, in an internet statement, Al-Qaeda's military wing in Iraq said it would target the homes of anyone who collaborated with the U.S. and the government and gave them 24 hours to stop the offensive. For the 12th consecutive night in France, violence continued with police saying that 1,173 vehicles were burnt and 330 people arrested overnight. President Jacques Chirac was expected to hold a cabinet meeting today, which was to give regional authorities the power to impose curfews if necessary to restore public order. For his part, Prime Minister Dominique de Villepin told the national French television yesterday that protecting people would be their number one priority and rejected all calls to use France's army against the rioters. De Villepin added that 500 reservists were being called up to reinforce 8,000 police officers already deployed. The rioters also burned churches, schools and businesses and injured 36 police officers. Attacks were reported in 274 cities and towns. Muslim fundamentalist leaders joined forces with the French political and religious officials who called upon the immigrants' youth to stop rioting and find other ways to express their grievances. The condemnations against the terrorist attack which targeted a family in the Valadruz district continue at the official and public levels. Fourteen people were martyred, including an infant. Hundreds of citizens in Baghdad held a funeral procession for the 14 martyrs killed by the terrorist bullets on the road connecting Valadruz and Nawrawan, north of Baghdad. Police sources confirmed that among the victims are four children and a woman, and said that the terrorists ambushed the victims while visiting their families during the Blessed Eid al-Fitr. Takfiri terrorists targeted innocent civilians, and this time 14 were martyred, including an infant, who is now a bird among the birds of paradise, and a child of two months. The victims were only guilty of being Iraqi citizens and living in this land. It is a desecration of the Quran, as well as a violation of Muslim dignity and the dignity of people in general. What about the saying of God's messenger, peace be upon him? Whoever says there's only one God has his religion, property, and dignity protected. What is the 10-day-old infant who has been killed guilty of? These heinous acts by the terrorists will not pass without punishment. 
especially since the government is determined to stop those attempting to infringe upon the country's security. This happened while the family was visiting its relatives in the Zatia district. The family had 11 members, including a 20-day-old infant and other children about the age of seven. I suspect that this is not the first incident of its kind in the area. In an earlier incident, we transported 20 bodies from the Nahrawan district to the al Tub al Adli district. What are the aims of those whose evilness and gunfire reach this child? for whom these peaceful men hold a funeral procession and condemn every wicked and vile act. We address every terrorist and criminal, telling them we are a cutting sword to all hypocrites and murderers. We fear God first and last. They are the savages who can't distinguish between right and wrong. They have faith in the abilities of the Iraqi people and the Iraqi security apparatus to rid them of terrorism. The people see and understand that these murderers have no goals other than to kill and steal the smiles off children's faces. Hassan al Atwani, al Iraqiya, Baghdad. Iran's chief nuclear negotiator says the European Union's foreign ministerial meeting's final statement reflects the misconceptions of the West on Iran. Secretary of the Supreme National Security Council, Ali Larijani, told reporters on Tuesday that nuclear talks are not confined to Britain, France and Germany and that Tehran hopes the negotiations with the EU trio will bear as positive results as the talks with other countries such as China and India. Commenting on the assertions by the British officials who intended to raise fears in Iran over the Security Council, Larijani said, quote, the UN Security Council is not something to be afraid of and does not tend to strip the Islamic Republic of its sovereign rights and peaceful nuclear technology. The chief negotiator went on to say the European Union has not to the moment officially asked Iran for a suspension of activities at Isfahan uranium conversion facility. However, as he added, Tehran is insisting on its rightful stances. Iran describes as unacceptable and surprising the statement by the European Union Foreign Minister's Council. Foreign Ministry spokesman Hamid Reza Asafi said that Tuesday and urged Europe to pay due regard in its statements and negotiations to Iran's legal right to apply nuclear technology for civilian purposes. In their Monday statement released in Brussels, the European Foreign Minister is voiced concern over Iran's nuclear program and called for an end to nuclear activities at Isfahan Uranium Conversion Facility. In reaction to the statement, Asafi said, quote, there should be a balance in sticking to agreements. It is unacceptable for Iran to comply with its obligations while Europe does not. This is absolutely impossible. All this came as envoys from over 36 countries, member in governing board of the International Atomic Energy Agency, as well as member states of the European Union held talks with Iran's Foreign Minister Anucheh Mutaki in Tehran behind closed doors. Foreign Ministry spokesman said Iran stands over its nuclear activities. The issue of Palestine and other regional issues were raised at the meeting. And Chairman of the Expediency Council, Akbar Hoshemi Rafsanjani, says Iran will go on with its confidence-building measures in its peaceful nuclear program. Mr. Rafsanjani told Japanese ambassador to Tehran Tuesday, the confidence-building is a two-way street where both sides need to take steps in their respect and avoid bringing forth illegal or even threatening issues. The Japanese diplomat in turn cited resolving of Iran's nuclear case as a key factor in Tehran-Tokyo ties. The views expressed on Mosaic are not those of Link TV or its sponsors, but of the broadcasters themselves. Mosaic is made possible by a grant from the John S. and James L. Knight Foundation, which promotes journalism excellence worldwide 
and invests in the vitality of 26 U.S. communities. And the William and Flora Hewlett Foundation. Additional support is provided by the Firedahl Foundation and Henry and Virgilia Dakin.